whenever you talk to addicts, they say, as soon as I started smoking again, I was smoking again. As soon as I took a drink, I was right back where I was. As soon as I did a line, I was right back. Well, that's how it was with surfing. As soon as I started surfing, I was right back where I was when I was, you know, 20, when I had last surfed. No different. It was all there. I was right back in it. Okay. And that was all for the good, except that I wanted to throw over my life in New York and move to Kauai. That was Thad Zelkowski. You're listening to Soundings, an audio series centered on all things surf, brought to you by the Surfer's Journal. I'm your host, Jamie Brissick. The Surfer's Journal is a reader-supported publication. Visit surfersjournal.com to subscribe. Thad is the author of the memoir On a Wave, which was a finalist for the Penn Martha Aubrin Award in 2003, and Wichita, a novel. His essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, Slate, Book Forum, Art Forum, Travel and Leisure, and Interview Magazine. So Thad recently wrote The Drop, and it's about surfing and addiction. And so Thad, I would ask, uh, what, what drew you to this as a subject to immerse in to the degree that you did? Yeah, what got me interested in addiction was just, um, you know, learning to surf. And uh, when I was 10 years old in Melbourne Beach and um, Florida, and... I, I was really struck by how powerful a hold it had on me and everyone I knew who surfed. And it held me and obsessed me even when there were not waves. Um, you know, the experience of learning to surf is very clearly, like neurochemically speaking, an addictive experience. Um, but I was just really... Um, always struck by the power of surfing uh, compared to other things I did. You know, I played a lot of sports. I played football. I played tennis. I played basketball. I played, you know, I skateboarded. I did all sorts of things. Nothing held a candle to surfing, uh, especially when the waves came up. Part of what I was really interested in that emerged in the course of doing the research for this book was that the reason surfing holds our attention so powerfully when there are no waves is really uh, uh, something that behaviorist uh, B.F. Skinner discovered in the 50s when he was doing an experiment on rats. He was feeding rats pellets to do certain things. What he discovered when he ran out of the pellets in the middle of this experiment was that if he fed the rats, if he rewarded the rats intermittently rather than consistently, it actually intensified their interest. So instead of discouraging the rats, the rats were more focused on doing the activity that got them the reward. And this is analogous to surfing. Not only analogous, this is the same phenomenon. Surfers pay more attention to waves when, because of their unpredictability than we would if waves were in a wave machine and we could sign up at 9 a.m. and get our wave every day. Now, the theory that I encountered that explains this or tries to explain it is that the brain evolved as a prediction machine. What we look at in the world to make predictions, uh, according to this theory, are patterns, rustles in the hedgerow. What is that? Is it a rat? Is it a mouse? Is it a bear? Is it a buffalo? What, you know, you, we had a lot of pressure on us as a species to really get it right. What does the weather mean? What is, what does that swirl in the water mean? What do sounds, what do bird calls mean as patterns? And if there was a pattern that we could not figure out because it had to do with our survival, we really paid attention. This even comes up in aesthetics, you know, where you listen to music and music that's really predictable is boring. Music that has a little bit of variety and uh, lures us along waiting for some pattern to emerge is more uh, mesmeric, more powerful for the same reason that waves that are irregular, in, in, you know, that swell up irregularity is powerful because we're kind of trying to figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what um, I found really fascinating about the brain research part of my, my book was that uh, it accounted, it theorized for um, the hold of surfing over me 
even when there were not waves, maybe especially when there are not waves, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I when I go on a surf trip, I really get deeply addicted. When I go to Hawaii or wherever, I I, I renew my addiction gets more intense, and I I, I get I I, sur I I get surfed out. And yet, when I'm when I'm back in New York or back in New Jersey, and there are no waves, I'm still thinking about it. I'm thinking about it all the time. It's kind of like it's the primary formation of my brain in a way because mm -hmm. I learned it so young right yeah. so anyway that's a, a kind of long-winded summary of some of the stuff I discovered about uh the addictiveness of surfing uh from a from a neurological and kind of brain research angle interesting and and timely given that uh that sort of artificial waves and wave pools have become so prominent um and there's that the the debate, and I mean, especially when it comes to the WSL events, and people are watching, and and you know, you get a lot of comments saying how utterly boring to see the same wave every single time. And um, what I loved about the book was there's a there's a memoir in there of you and your love of surfing and your own addiction, and then there's also um, some of the great stories. And what what I realized that I hadn't thought about so much is so many of the surfers that I've grown up loving and and looking up to were were addicts and when i say addicts not surf addicts i'm talking drug you know substance abuse abusers um what stories were most compelling to you when you were in the research you went you know uh andy irons rick rasmussen etc cetera, etc cetera. What, what what was most compelling to you i always found the jeff hackman story really interesting because he seemed like such a quarterback he seemed like such a clean cut guy um, Peter Mel's story for, had a similar kind of appeal to me because of the outward appearance of Mel as this really up, upstanding kind of solid guy. And I've always found that aspect of addiction to be really interesting. Like you can't, you can't tell. It's not visible. It's mm -hmm. not predictable in a certain way. And so I liked, I was drawn to the stories where it was less obvious. I mean, the Rick Rasmussen story is more... You know, Rick Rasmussen is more classic kind of adrenaline junkie charger. Mm -hmm. And his his addiction and his death involved, you know, that come that is all entangled in drugs, um, was more predictable and kind of compelling, but but I was really interested in the ones where it wasn't as obvious and um and yet they had really intense addictions. Hackman nearly died a number of times. He had a fifteen year heroin addiction. And Peter Mel's addiction to methamphetamine was not as lo not as lengthy, but I mean, it really humbled him and made him changed him as a person, to, especially to get over it. Mm -hmm. That's true with Flea too. Flea's story is really interesting, and the Flea, Peter Mel, the companion of the, their stories, that the way they were competitors with each other at Mavericks, and the way they also both became addicted to methamphetamine. And the way, the different ways they reacted to it, um, that to that addiction, well, I found that really fascinating. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there's just so much, and so many of our the top surfers seem to have been conditioned by surfing in a way that made them more prone to get addicted to substances. Yeah. Um, but you know, Jamie, you know, name some of the people that I haven't, that I didn't deal with in the book who come up for you. Like you know, surf history so well. Like what? Think of let's let's talk about some addicts who 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 didn't make it into the book. Yeah, I mean, well, there are so many. You know, I came of age, or I came to surfing, let's say, uh, at Malibu in the late seventies, early eighties, and it was such a part of the culture. I mean, it was um, to in some way the way to sort of gain status or or earn respect was to surf really well and then and then be sort of daring when it came to drinking or smoking weed or what and and then it, and then cocaine came in in the 80s as, as well and um it was celebrated and i never and then I, of course like i grew up skateboarding and from the age of about 10 years old i looked up to the dogtown skateboarders and they always had this this sort of well how would i say like they were they were kind of detached and sort of lost in their skateboarding. And only when I tried smoking pot for the first time did I realize actually they were just really stoned. You know, they were like, they would puff a joint before they would go skate Kenter or Paul Revere, and they would be in the groove of, like, like jazz musicians playing together, having just smoked a bunch of weed, where they're sort of in that groove. And it's kind of a great groove, and it's, but it's also a dangerous thing. I mean, at the, I don't smoke pot at all anymore, but for so many years I did. And it was this thing of, you know, smoking 
in the parking lot paddling out and, and just staying in that groove the entire time. So there are so many, you know, we're looking, in your book, you document a lot of the sort of heroes of surfing who had the addiction, but there are so many that sort of, uh, what would you say, unsung heroes or, or local heroes who whose names won't really mean anything here, but I think like anyone of a certain age or of our generation will definitely relate to that thing of the the parallel of good surfer parties real hard, you know? Yeah, I mean, and yet in like on the pro tour, and you can speak to this a bit better. Um, as soon as there started to get a big corporate surf apparel interest in surfing, there was a kind of anxiety about drugs um, because they they didn't want the stigma attached, you know, like. Part of the sort of interesting thing about this book for me was to come out as an addict. And even though I'm not a professional athlete, you know, there's a stigma attached to addiction. Um, And uh, there's less there's less of a stigma attached to addiction in the arts than there is in sports, because in sports, there's always that potential taint of um, of putting an asterisk by any achievement that occurs on drugs. So this happens with the Mavericks uh, charging, you know, any kind of thing. Did he was he on meth when he rode that wave? Was he was he on acid when he rode that wave? And it sort of delig- it threatens the legitimacy of an achievement. Uh, drugs do in sports, but in, in the arts, there's less of a stigma. And yeah, for instance, I'll give you an example. I was thinking about this. So you take Charlie Parker, who is this you know legendary. Uh, <clears throat> jazz musician and charlie parker was also famous for having a heroin addiction he influenced a lot of other jazz players to try heroin because charlie parker was so damn good they were like well hell maybe i need this edge too maybe some of what his maybe this brilliant stuff he's doing is connected to the heroin but in surfing you i don't think there's something there's not that same parallel so like hackman no one who knew hackman was going to say oh i'm going to do heroin so i can surf like jeff Mm -hmm. right it doesn't really track the same way it's a different culture there's a clean there's a kind of pure for for all the decadence of the 80s and you were there there's still a very strong purity complex or culture in surfing when it comes to drugs um there's a lot of health food, uh, yeah. you know, surfer, surfers invented smoothies, surfers invented health food, right? There's a lot of pride taken in clean living and surfing that you don't see in the arts. Yeah. So when I got addicted to cocaine and alcohol, I was doing it when I had quit surfing in my, you know, early, tw- or early 20s or late teens. And I, I was living in the city as a poet. And I, I, I was I was doing I was drinking alcohol and doing drugs in a tradition that had to do with the arts and with poetry and with a they're almost like a visionary tradition. Yeah. In surfing, there there isn't the same thing, but there is there are drugs, right? It's it, it, it tracks onto addiction so heavily because of the seemingly because of the neurochemical formation of learning to surf, being part of that what I was talking about a minute ago with the brain, all the things that it does to your brain. And all the things it does to make you kind of an adrenaline junkie too. Mm-hmm. So the the same irregularity of of waves also means that there's a lot of downtime. So what do you do if you're if you're Jeff Hackman and you are used to surfing or you love to surf 25 plus Waimea Bay? Well, how many times does Waimea Bay get to be even 20 foot per year? Five, seven times, sometimes. You know, very few times. Mm-hmm. So people who are oriented toward big waves are, are are kind of saddled with the problem of, well, what do I do yeah. with my with all this downtime? And you know, on the pro tour, as you saw, there's a lot of partying at night. You know, and um, uh, just bacchanal, right? Big and time. So there's that culture. There's a there's that kind of beach. There's a kind of beach boy hedonism in surfing that is a true tradition that comes out of just hanging out at the beach, cooking, drinking. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when the drugs came into it in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, the drugs were just integrated into that tradition of beach boy hedonism. But it's a different it still has a different force to it than it does in the arts. And I think there's a greater degree of shame yeah. attached to drugs in surfing and a greater degree of hiding it. Yeah. 
Um, and that makes it harder to deal with. No, you know, you touched on something so interesting because I, I, I joined the Pro Tour in 1986 and cocaine was popular for sure. But, you know, the thing that's so interesting is I think surfing was always trying to sort of clean up its image, right? Like when the when the tour began, the IPS in 1976, um, you know, Rabbit, Sean, MR, etc., they were trying to create a cleaner image because surfers were already regarded as sort of these marginalized dirt bags. Um, and I think through the eighties there, when I was on tour, I mean, it was incredible how hard people partied. And, and I, I mean, I remember specifically the year Martin Potter won the world title in 1989. It was like the most decadent year of my life, quite honestly. Um, and it was, and it was a, it was a thing where great, great surfing was also kind of equated or conflated with partying all night long. And some of the, top performers of that particular year and that and that particular year i guess um were were as hardcore at night as they were you know on the board in the day um so it really was it and and what you say about the shame is so interesting because meanwhile the industry is trying to break into the mainstream and sort of again sanitize surfing make it look really clean cut and healthy when in fact like the superstars had these had these sort of closet habits going um and i remember i mean i even felt it at the time that some of the guys that were that were such high achievers and i would watch i mean tom carroll talks very openly about it in his own book and in your book um but watching him you know win a pipeline masters let's say and come into like you know thousands of people on the beach applauding him and he's writing and getting chaired up the beach and what have you um the, just i could almost sense that that high would be a, a joy in the moment and maybe a curse down the track because when where do you find that ever again in your life and you're only 27 years old and you've got <laughs> another 60 years or more to live um so that thing is, is 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 a fascinating one um but then it's interesting like ai who you write about so beautifully in your book uh, andy irons his story is is in many ways i mean there was so much going on with andy personally but that was like it was a it was a kind of um aligning of the stars in a, in a, in a, in a sort of terrible way in the sense of his addiction was so big, but it was at a time when the industry was, it was so much trying to uh, whitewash and cover over what was really going on. And I imagine that, um, that, you know, not to say that if he were a visual artist and it was, he wore it on his sleeve, but I think the, the idea that, Oh, people can't find out about what I'm doing would only compound the addiction, which is a terrible kind of irony. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's always fascinated me, and I, and I, I really love what you say about uh, in the arts, um, it, it's, it's more a part of it. But, you know, I think part of the popularity of surfing right now is that it, it does seem like one of the most absolute healthy things you could ever do. And yet our, our culture and community has a lot of addiction in it. Right, right, right. It's something that surfing struggles with, and I, I think that... Um it's hard to gauge it right now. Like you look right now at the world tour and the dominant uh, surfers in the world, and they seem extremely clean living. Uh, they're professional athletes. They have nutritionists, they train. And they, the level of competition is so high and so intense that no one dares to stray into any recreational drug use. That's the impression I get, but I don't know what's really going on. I mean, I may have been my impression of Andy Irons if I'd been paying really, if I, when Andy Irons was at his peak, he looked pretty uh, healthy and clean living too. But I mean, I think the, the heavy thing about professional surfing for someone like Andy Irons and, and a lot of these guys in general is that people come to surfing <clears throat> and really get bonded with it often because they have like a tough life at home or something's going on and they have some need of relief, you know, like Andy Irons had a learning disorder. He had dyslexia. He was tracked into, um, into uh, special ed classes and he was teased mercilessly for this. His parents got divorced when he was 10. He was a Howley boy in Kwai, uh, you know, a heavily native Hawaiian culture in which, you know, it's hard to grow, to be a blonde kid growing up. Um, so he had, he had three obvious, what are called in research addiction, adverse childhood experiences. Um, that, that like in my own experience, I was, my family was divorced and my brother, younger brother was suffering from mental illness. And my father, <laughs> my stepfather committed suicide when I was 17. My brother committed suicide when I was 30. 
and was talking about it. So I had a lot of I had a lot going on at home at home too. What it did for me is made surfing like extremely important at the level of giving me relief from the suffering I was experiencing at home, basically, or due to a domestic kind of turmoil or domestic kind of ominousness. Surfing immersed me. It, it gave me relief and it gave me a sense of other, an alternative family. And it created this, alt, it gave, I just, I could, you know how it is when you go surfing, you completely forget the life you live on shore. Yeah. It's so such a blessing in that way. And you, you come to feel so strong and kind of powerful in the waves in a way that you can't feel anywhere else. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the way surfing ends up being truly beneficial. Right. And really salvational. And that's how I generally regard it, but it is a, still an addiction and it's a, but it's a good addiction. So when I in order to quit drugs and alcohol, I, I kind of simultaneously found surfing again in my mid thirties, having thought I would never do it again. But when I did it again, right, it gave me a sort of purpose. It gave me not a purpose, but it gave me a structure around which to quit the drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. quit smoking. I needed to be fit. So I got fit and I got a new board and I, I and, and, and humorously, right. You know, you, you always, whenever you talk to addicts, they say, as soon as I started smoking again, I was smoking again. As soon as I took a drink, I was right back where I was. As soon as I did a line, I was right back. Well, that's how it was with surfing. As soon as I started surfing, I was right back where I was when I was, you know, 20, when I had last surfed. No different. It was all there. I was right back in it. Okay. And that was all for the good, except that I wanted to throw over my life in New York and move to Kauai. Mm -hmm. It was very disruptive for me to start to surf again, right? It wasn't just consequence free because surfing will and does commonly overtake people's lives. And so I had to kind of sit back and go like, Thad, you have a tenure track job in the city. You're not going to move to Kauai. You yeah. know, you've got to like get it under control here. So I had to figure out a way to to surf again, but not for it to derail my life. Yeah. And that's that. And the reason I mentioned that is because if you look at addictions on a spectrum, surfing is kind of in the middle, mm -hmm. right? On the very far end is methamphetamine and heroin, right? It's almost exclusively destructive. Surfing is primarily salubrious, primarily healthy, but it's also got the destructive edge. Yep. It can also make you isolated or it can also make you reckless. It can make you, um, what's the word, um, imprudent, you mm -hmm. know, do things impulsive. For me, it has a lot of impulsivity in it. Like when I'm, you know, around surfing, I'll like drop things or I'll, I'll almost get in a car crash or I'll park illegally or I'll jump a fence or you know, it, does, it causes me to do things I wouldn't normally do because I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. No, you touch on something so interesting, and it's something that I've observed. I'm I'm in my middle 50s now, and, um, you know, so many of the surfers that I grew up uh, admiring and wanting to surf like and, and in many ways admiring the choices they've made in their life, I've watched how surfing has consumed their lives. They're, they're, they're now uh, without careers, without families. You know, via the selfishness or obsession of surfing, their lives have been, uh, you know, they, they find themselves almost marooned in late middle age with not a lot. And, you know, when the, I watched this fantastic thing at Malibu's Maya home break where if there's a swell and you and you go down on a sunny day during a swell, it is like as fun of a place in an environment as you could ever want to be in with so many great people and waves breaking and everyone's, you know, focus is, is towards the water and pointing out at the, the, the various riders across the waves, you go on a small kind of, uh, or, or a flat overcast day, and it's about the saddest place in the world to be down on the beach. And you see mm -hmm. the folks who have sort of bet everything they have on surfing to fulfill them, they're, they're kind of bereft. There's, there's not a lot there on those days. Um, but it's an interesting one, which brings me to the next thing. You know, you grew up in, or you started surfing in Florida, and you competed, and you were a member of the Dick Cotri surf team, which from what I gather was very prestigious at the time. And you, uh, you sort of had um, the focused, long, long view and discipline to decide to educate yourself, and you got a PhD went to Yale and got a PhD, which is, which is so rare for a serious surfer. Um, and you know, this, we're talking about a, a, addiction. And the one thing that's kind of built into the addiction of surfing is 
a lot of the great surfers we admired, they didn't get college educations. Those years were consumed by chasing waves. Um, and you, you did this other thing. Talk about, uh, talk about Yale, talk about what you learned. What was that like? Yeah. I mean, I, I really, so I, I, I quit surfing in order to kind of focus on college. I kind of quit it like a drug. Right. But I think that if I had grown up in Hawaii and I had not grown up in Melbourne beach, Florida, it would have been much more difficult for me to break with. I also had a, on my father's side, I had all these academics, like my, my father's side is all these professors. So I was kind of beckoned to by a sense of familial, like not destiny, but like it called to me in a really powerful way, this other side that was a, a, absolutely antithetical to surfing because it was about the Northeast and at least in my imagination, right? It's about, it's about New England and it's about self-abnegation in a certain way. It's not about the body at all. It's about the mind. Mm -hmm. And I liked, in a certain way, I liked the prospect of just ditching my body. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I had been such a body person growing up. Yeah. And, and the culture in Florida is a lot like California. It's like it's a body culture. You know, you're always playing tennis. You're always surfing. You're always doing something physical. And I, I was at some level exhausted by that. I wanted to explore this other side of my consciousness. And so I just completely broke with surfing. I went to college undergrad, got more and more serious as I went. Then I took a few years off and I worked as a waiter, as a poet in DC. And, and I just couldn't handle living hand and mouth. I started, I was starting to drink and starting to drug heavily. And I thought, okay, you need to get a fellowship and get out of the workforce. And so I, I kind of mustered my, I, I got, I applied to Yale and a bunch of other PhD programs and I got into Yale and I got a full, full ride. And I thought, okay, I'm safe now. I can go to school again. I can take refuge in the monastery of the university. And that's what I did. And I stayed there for like eight years, you know, with some time off. And uh, it was just like a place for me. It was in a weird way, analogous to surfing because it was liminal. It was like I was off out of the culture. Surfing takes you out of the mainstream world. And so does being a graduate student. So that's another way of talking about this book is I'm trying to deal with the integration of mind and body. And addiction is such a kind of obvious thing to do with that. You know, like addiction is like everything I learned about addiction that's cerebral, like has to do with neurochemistry, would not have helped me at all as an addict, I don't think. I could have known everything there was to know about addiction and still be trying to cop, still get my drugs and, and kind of think about it as I was high. It takes an emotional and almost like a physical decision when you want to get sober and quit. So for me, it was like psychic surgery to quit alcohol. First, mm -hmm. I first quit alcohol and then fully drugs, uh, cocaine. I had to kind of reach into myself and do this. Like I it was extremely hard to talk about, but it's like a kind of like almost like a kind of reordering of my innards. You mm -hmm. know, it was very intense. It was very emotional. It was solitary. <clears throat> and like I say, it felt like I felt like I lay down on a bed and cut my stomach open with a, a hand handmade like knife or something like a shank. And I reordered myself. Now, nothing in that experience would have been, I don't think anything I would have learned in my mind would have helped me with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. That was something I came to because I painted myself into a corner. I was desperate to change mm -hmm. and I changed, mm -hmm. but it was not, it was not, it was not about knowledge. It was about emotional uh, uh, an emotional conclusion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was like about survival. Yeah. It was like survival. And, uh, but that was very physical mm -hmm. uh, also, right? And spiritual. And that I think is the sort of place of addiction is everything in that way. It is, it is spiritual, it's mental, but it's also very physical. And so for me, like to get back in touch to my, with my body through surfing was so key because if I felt the joy of my body, if I went back in time through my body to the period where I was joyous uh, and a surfer, I, I knew I would be able to, to really let go of the drugs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Surfing held an original joy for me, right? Yeah. It holds it. 
And I find it still as a 61 year old, I go out there and I'm just like, I may as well be 12 years old. Yeah. I feel all of those pleasures. I feel nothing less intensely at 61 at the, on the arrival of a good swell than I did as a kid. Yeah. And it's an, it's a miraculous thing. And surfing is such a gift in that way. And I, 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 I do believe that it can help people who are addicted or suffering in some way who have never surfed. I think they can learn to surf and, and I think surfing can help. Yep. Yeah. You know, I remember when you and I met, uh, 15 or so years ago, we both lived in the city. You, you were in Brooklyn. I was in downtown Manhattan and we would go surfing whenever there was a swell. And we, so we, we would, we were chasing waves. Um, but we would all, we also bonded on this thing of kind of consciously breaking away from surfing, um, to pursue some other things. And, uh, and that was rare. I mean, I didn't have any any friends who loved surfing that ever actually questioned it. It would seem like it would be, you know, it was it was you just follow it without without second guessing. Um, when I read your book, what was so interesting is you were kind of analyzing surfing in a way that, f- for lack of a better description, would be incredibly uncool to the average surfer. It's sort of like part of the culture is not to look in, into it with the uh, with the science that you did, the neuroscience that you brought to it. And, um, and yeah, I thought it was really interesting to kind of learn about, um, something that I f- knew and felt intuitively, but then to have, I guess, terminology for it and description and, and sort of, um, scientific explanation. Yeah. I mean, surfing is not a book culture. It doesn't, have much interest in analyses or even representations of itself, except in, in film and in still photography. I mean, surfing is a very visual culture and, um, I, I've kind of resigned myself to write about surfing and it not being read by surfers. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm all right. I have, you have to get all right. You have to get all right. But I also think that it's surfing is such a subculture. And so, it's a bit like jazz. It's a kind of a hipster culture where there's a scorn for theorizing it. And I respect that. And I, I, I'm, I, as I say, I'm kind of resigned to that reality, but I don't think it's possible to write about surfing <clears throat> properly without getting some alienation from it, without being distanced from it. And I think that because only because I quit and walked away for so long and, and focused on literature, could I write about it properly, at least in my, to my satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I knew I, and yet I knew also that all that work to translate it was not really for other surfers. It was, it was for the rest of the world Mm -hmm. that didn't surf. That's what's hard about writing and representing surfing, especially in writing is that a surfers aren't that interested in hearing about it because it seems wonky and um, redundant and B because it's so, because it is such a specific tribal subcultural, it's hard to write about. And yet the difficulty is what's attractive to me Mm -hmm. as a writer. I mean, I like the fact that it's hard to write about and hard to translate. And I like being a translator in the sense of like a a native informant. Yep. Um, You live, when I met you, you were living in Brooklyn. Now you're in Montclair, New Jersey. Surfing is still, prominent in your life but what is talk a little bit about your work yeah uh, so i work at this uh biography center and the the graduate center in cuny and we what we do is we give five four or five fellowships a year to working biographers um so uh we look at like a hundred plus applications and we choose four or five so we have someone coming in who's writing a biography of uh nam june pike and that's one subject. Someone's writing one on uh, R. Crumb. You know, one of our biographers is writing on R. Crumb. It's a great, it's a, it's a lovely job at the level of all the intellectual variety. So every year I'm dealing with people who are working on, you know, it'll be a writer uh, last year, Peter Matheson and James Baldwin. And um, someone's writing a biography of Lauren Michaels from SNL. Mm-hmm. So what I do as a, as an associate director there is help people kind of make it, you know, give them what they need to do their work, but also to give them critiques of their chapters. So someone will write, will, and that, that's what they really value is, you know, once or twice per year, we will do a close reading of a chapter that that's in progress on a, on a, on a biography in progress. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
Yeah. So I, like I kind of hinted out a minute ago, I grew up, one of the forms I read a lot as a kid, one of the ways I learned history was biography. And, um, you know, when I was doing the work for this book, I read the chap, the Hackman biography is quite good from, uh, I think Quicksilver put it out that deals with his addiction, very detailed, you know, and I, uh, a lot of surfer profiles, a lot of profiles of surfers that you read growing up on Surfer Magazine and Surfing Magazine were biographies in miniature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm kind of, I like the form and I like, I like memoir, I like autobiography and I like biography. Mm -hmm. And so I feel very kind of comfortable in that world. And um, it's like I say, kind of stimulating because every year we're getting new book, new projects to look at. Yep. I have, uh, I've audited your classes and I've also uh, enjoyed your mentorship and teaching. Um, and you've helped me so much with my own writing throughout the years. How does your writing go? What, like, where uh, do you write at home or do you write at your office at, at Cooney? Um, and what time of day and how does it all work? I tend to, you know, I've gotten myself in the habit of writing in the morning, um, I, 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 you know, Every book's different. I tend to write longhand and then switch over to computer. And, um, you know, I can write maybe four hours a day, four or five hours a day, not super long. I'm a slow writer. I'm perfectionistic. I'm style. I, I, I had years spent as a poet. I, had, I have a collection of poems out. So I come to narrative writing from a poet perspective, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. But I've slowly kind of taught myself to write narrative and um, how writing that memoir helped. And now I'm working on a kind of crime thriller about a surfer and I'm reading a lot of Elmore Leonard and sort of studying that. And I'm always, I feel like I'm always kind of trying to challenge myself. Like the, the drop is a, is a weird hybrid of, you know, some essay, some memoir, some, some neuroscience, uh, some, some profiles of surfer addicts. And there, it's a kind of curious, hybrid. Mm -hmm. Now I'm moving into a genre which is very familiar and kind of linear. And mm -hmm. I'm excited by that, like learning to do that. So mm -hmm. right now I'm doing a lot of reading and note taking, but in not in the near future, I'm going to start writing in straight up earnest. Um, and I'm excited about that. So that's kind of what it is. But it, I feel like methodologically, I, I, it's pretty much just writing in the morning and trying to get down on paper and not get too self conscious that I'm getting um, constipated by my love of great sentences. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. I don't want that to be, I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good as the French say. <laughs> getting sober, Thad, what, uh, what, what was the thing that helped you the most? Um, like I say, surfing, I, I, I don't know what I would have done. I would have had to figure out some other kind of body work um, wilderness thing. I don't know what would have done it. But it, for me, it was just going surfing, think, allowing surfing back into my consciousness as a kind of focal point so that I was reading about it again and thinking about it and taking trips. So I went to places. Well, when I quit surfing, I was just a kind of broke kid. I didn't have any, I didn't travel. I think the only place I ever left Florida to surf was Outer Banks and that one contest. And, um, so I went to Puerto Rico, I went to Puerto Escondido, I went to Hawaii, I got married in Kauai. I was like finally getting to surf these really heavy waves that I'd longed that I'd always read about and wanted to surf and was frightened of surfing. And, um, that was those kind of trips and just surfing in New York and surfing through the winter, trying to surf through the winter in New York. And then in New Jersey was, that was a huge part of it. Uh, Mm -hmm. on a daily level, like at a, like a week to week level. And, um, I, I just kind of did it on my own. I didn't really have a big community. I didn't go to meetings. I don't go to meetings now. I just kind of surf and I write. And yeah. Everyone does it differently. And there are all sorts of recidivism rates. You can do whatever you like. You can do all the meetings you want and go all to the, all the therapy you want. But if it's not, if you're, if you're relapsing, it's not working. You've got to do what works. And for me, it was just surfing, <laughs> surfing and writing. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I do think it's helped me a little more to, to kind of come out as an addict, even though it was awkward, I, even though I, I, I kind of didn't allow myself to, 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 to think about it too much when I was writing this book, but this book has been 
a kind of confession to my own addiction. And uh, a lot of people were startled by that. They were like, what? You had an addiction? Because it wasn't really obvious to everyone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, obvious to the people closest to me. But so, um, you know, I do think that it's good to be open about it. I think that helps. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful to the surfers who came forward and spoke about it. A lot of them, a lot of people who might have did not. And I totally respect that. I don't hold it against anyone. It's very hard to admit to. Uh, because, like I say, there's a stigma attached to addiction. All we know about it, uh, all we, the ways in which it's talked about as a brain disorder or a learning disorder do not fully clear up the stigma. You know, there's a stigma, uh, there's a sense of you're having something wrong with you or uh, uh, you're immoral or you have a character flaw or personality. Uh, you're, you know, something's wrong. And I do think something's wrong. I think there's something wrong with me and I think there's something wrong with all of us and we're all looking for a relief from our suffering and the key to that, from what I can make out, is a good captivity. And surfing is a good bondage. It's good captivity for me, holds my attention and it makes me excited and joyful, but it is in its way, you know, a, a replacement addiction. Mm -hmm. So I believe in replacement addictions. I don't believe you can be free of addiction, especially if you've had an addiction. Mm -hmm. I think you need to find a good one to substitute for the bad one. You've had a meditation practice long before, much longer than it's been fashionable to have a meditation practice. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, I forget about meditation. Funny, because it's so much a part of my daily life. I started meditating. My mother gave me TM lessons when I was 16, and I got I took to it right away. It reminded me a lot of surfing. It's like a trance. Something that you and I talked about once I wanted to that comes to mind when I think about meditation is, you know, like a lot of surfers will be able to relate to this uh, uh, moment. Like, and this is the kind of thing that I've never seen in print. But so you're sitting out there waiting for waves, right? and nothing's coming but the sunlight's on the water and you're kind of just slip into a trance waiting you're vigilant you're waiting but you're like in a meditative state i also felt when i was a kid especially like the light sunlight and the water and being out there was doing something to me almost like purifying me or um what uh, cauterizing me it would almost feel like this process was happening mm -hmm. but it was very trance like and my eyelids would kind of droop and I would sit there and I'd be in a meditative, essentially I'd be in a meditative state. So when I started to, to meditate formally and was taught by these two graduate students when I was, this is when we had moved to Kansas, uh, I learned in Wichita, it, it was like, oh yeah, I know this. I know this experience. And so I took to it quickly and I've done it ever since off and on. I mean, sometimes I've taken hiatuses. It was very helpful to me when it came to kind of supporting my uh, anytime I've wanted to try to do to accomplish something I've, I've started to meditate very very regularly like morning and afternoon and right now I'm in the same groove and I basically I do it in the morning and I do it in the afternoon I do it first thing 20 minutes I do it in the afternoon 20 minutes and if I'm doing it twice a day that really I notice the benefits of that and um, I noticed also Tom Carroll, he teaches TM or mm -hmm. he certainly teaches meditation. And uh, we had a lot, we had a good conversation about meditation that didn't make it into the book. But yeah, so I think that surfers are kind of primed to meditate too. Mm -hmm. But it is something I've been doing since I was 16 and I don't even think to mention it because it's so like, <laughs> like brushing my teeth or something. But yeah, mm -hmm. it is a big part of things for me on a daily level. It's great. And th thanks for making the time, Thad. Okay, buddy. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. Our theme song is Neptune's Next by Little Wings. The Surfer's Journal is a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Vesla, and Yeti. To subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you again.